Welcome to the OC24 podcast, where we've taken some of the best talks and discussions from this year's 24-hour conference on global organised crime, which showcases some of the most interesting research into organised crime around the world. This episode is called Crime and Music. Welcome, everybody, to this uh, author meet critics type of uh, encounter on our book, Crime and Music. In um, our daily news, music is often presented in connection with some criminal problems and also problems of organized crime. In our book, we have four chapters that deal with problems of organized crime. I'm now talking about the Netherlands experience when I say that in the news in Holland, we often hear about youngsters, young men who kill, who carry guns, who knife people, and they are coming out of the scene of so-called drill rap. Now, uh, that is one connection between music and organized crime. There is in Holland also a serious problem of organized crime from South America and Mexico. And uh, that has to, of course, to do with the international drugs trade. And the music made by narco corridas, or in the form of narco corridas, plays a serious role in their murder ballots. They are part of an ideological discourse of this development. Not long ago, it's a third example, there was the Kosovo Balkan War in which there was a famous uh, criminal who worked together with the Serbian um, uh, government. His name was Arkan, and he was part of his time in Holland, and he was famous before he knew so well how to break out of the prison. The music connected with him is the music that a son is sung by his wife, and um, it's a style of music that's called turbo folk. There's also a chapter on that. Jihad fighters, fourth problem, uh, are not supposed um, to uh, listen to music at all as for rel religious reasons. But they, in fact, do so in the form of anasit. Sounds play an enormous role. And the last chapter, the last example, is comes probably closest to what we ordinarily consider in America uh, organized crime. And that is when I found out that um, jazz music has been enormous help, enormously helped, especially in the first half of the last century by gangsters and by organized crime criminals. Now, the idea to make a book came out of um, Syrok chairperson uh, Lena Siegel, who is amongst us, um, who is a great lover of music. Um, and she, uh, well, asked me, let's try and find instances where crime, or maybe specifically organized crime, are important in the role that, that where uh, music plays a role. This, of course, lead, uh, led to a search without boundaries. Music and crime in present and in part in all places of the world and in the most unexpected corners. It's hard to find unity in the idea of 
a theory of crime and music at all. And it would potentially determine what question would be, that would it potentially determine what sort of questions would be uh, all together uh, that have to be answered in the theory. But uh, there's a kind of unexpected connection that would interest of interest all of us, all of those people who are interested in both. And I think that is their background in so-called cultural criminology. Dina and, and I look for suitable authors for this specific subject. Now, the idea of making a book out of it met with enormous, enormously uh, uh, enthusiastic responses by those who told Frank Bovenkerk on the stimulating gangsters, uh, the gangsters, for example, or in jazz music. I'm now going to put a little bit more light so that I can read my own writing. There was uh, no problem at all to find interesting contributors. Their responses were quite spontaneous and enthusiastic. Now, <clears throat> the original idea came from Professor Siegel that I now introduce you. She is professor of criminology in the law faculty of Utrecht in the Netherlands. And she is a very much read uh, writer, a very popular teacher and a prolific writer. I am uh, happy to have been with her as my successor because she keeps me interested really in the subject and she keeps me going uh, doing scientific research, even uh, when I'm not the youngest of the four of us. Her boundless and enthusiasm for cultural criminology make this possible. Then <clears throat> we find Jeffrey McKelly Wayne here. He um, is a historian and a criminologist. I know him from 25 years ago very well when he came with his tutor, Professor Alan Block, to, uh, to do criminology in Holland and with a group of students. Now I see that he has uh, written a book together with Joseph Albini on uh, well, um, the organized crime problem, trying to uh, to make it uh, deconstructing, and I think very much that he is following his Alan Block example of how to deconstruct ideas of organized crime. <clears throat> then. There is René van Zwaningen. He is a widely read professor of criminology in Rotterdam University. He is um, very big into critical criminology, and best known for it. A very successful author on that. Um, and he also now writes on, with great influence, on questions of public safety and management of fear. He is well known for his interest in cultural criminology. That's who we are. I would now like to open the floor and ask who is going to comment on the subject of our book, Crime and Music. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Frank and Dina, for inviting me uh, to this panel. 
I'm uh, very happy. I know both of you very for a very long time. Frank even brought the book to my home address personally, so that is uh, that is a special treatment. So I couldn't escape, uh, and I didn't want to escape either. Uh, I read the book with uh, with great joy for an interest in cultural criminology and also an interest in music. And we had some several seminars uh, on it also related to the, the Dutch Flemish Journal of Cultural Criminology, um, of which I'm in the editorial board together with Dina. And um, yeah, the book covers a lot of dimensions on the relation between crime and punishment. It's about the criminalization of, of, of music. There are chapters on real crime that are music related. It's the role of organized crime in the music yeah, production, so to say, the role of music in crimes against humanity um, and music as, as a form of resistance. So these are the, the five uh, um, sections of the book uh, that are covered. It marks the richness of the book, I would say, but also the reason why it feels a bit of a, of a mixed bag. Too many, many chapters, some very, very good, that have uh, very little to do with each other sometimes. So, the first shot that I, that I uh, was heading it uh, when, when I was um, about to read the book is, well, what, what, would the, uh, what would the editors have to say about the diversity of the book? Uh, it starts with an uh, interesting expose of Frank and, and Dina um, of how various thinkers have interpreted the role, the function of music in society. Uh, this this socio-musicology, as it is called, uh, makes a good starting point for a cultural criminology of crime, uh, of music, I would say. Um, an ample number of examples on how music binds or indeed creates constitutes deviant subcultures uh, just like certain clothing smoking habits dance styles I mean definitely it, it, it is made uh, a powerful argument for 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 let's say the constitutive role of music in various in various subcultures and 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 very for various political and and, and cultural motives Unfortunately, it remains a little bit up uh, too much uh, to, to summing up certain examples without actually analyzing them in depth. And that I was missing a bit. The authors lack a connecting theory in earlier works of crime, on crime and music, but also this volume doesn't help us much in that direction of, of let's say, uh, an overarching theory of, cultural criminal, of the cultural criminology of, 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 of music. Um, drawing on enthusiasm and personal taste of the authors. That's fair enough, uh, but it does make the choices made a little bit feel arbitrary uh, as, as, as what, a, what the setup of the, of the book is. Seemingly, there's no methodological or no visible methodological consideration behind uh, the choice of the authors or, or indeed the themes. Uh, not only many st many styles of music are being covered, but also m music from very different times. And I would like to have a little bit more of an analytic t uh, take on, on, on that diversity. Now, for me, as a, as, a, as a discussant, it's also quite impossible to cover all. Um, and also my choices probably will be uh, necessarily be arbitrary. Um, in order to tell a story about um, the difference of 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 the uh, yeah the different developments of, of of the crime and music or music as resistance over time, uh, some obvious contemporary examples are missing. For example, I missed punk music not only because I was raised in that particular era, but it is let's say. Yeah, the, the, the spirit of the time of the 70s and 80s that is very well covered in this. And um, yeah, it, it's also the destructive nature and the anti-establishment nature that would have made, let's say, also from the 70s and 80s a good, a good, uh, good addition. 
repression i was also thinking of repression in of explicit lyrics in mainstream music industry today that would also have been as far as censorship is going to uh, is is concerned and a very interesting uh, a very interesting uh, uh, topic i mean um what can you say? I mean, it's a little bit also of the cancelling, the cancelling culture that that is going on today. What does become clear, uh, though, is how music is instrumentalized for all kinds of political aspirations. Uh, not in the last place, nationalism. Nationalism plays in many of the of the essays a very important role, and the role of music in 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 constituting a national spirit and national identity. Maybe if I would 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 have to say, well, what what is the main basso continuo to speak in a musical metaphor of the book? Then it would be this: it's the facilitating role of music in creating identity. Hmm. Um, so. That is what I took of the book, and um, yeah, potentially interesting analytic lines are suggested, but never really elaborated. Um, so I'll, I'll do my best to do something about that. But um, it, of course, um, I can't help also to be to be uh, yeah picking picking my my favorites uh, from the book by, by for this reason. Um, it makes uh, reviewing it makes it a different ta difficult task I must say it's impossible to seriously deal with with 13 very different 14 if you include the, the introduction 14 uh, di uh, very different chapters and it's asked too much of a reviewer to elaborate on possible connections or common analysis what is left is saying something about the number of the chapters equally arbitrary possibly and indeed based on a personal interest in that sense the book offers a lot to discover huh? it's um, the authors of the different chapters know what they are talking about and that's always nice if you have that that feeling at least uh, in literally every chapter I found many things I didn't know and which I found very, very interesting. So it was a, a, also a big learning experience uh, for me. This includes, for example, attempts to Nazify a popular style of music like jazz, uh, coinciding with a critique of the cultural Bolshevism. Also a term that in, the, in, in today's times uh, of nativist populism, of the increased popularity of nativist populism, is popping up again. Uh, cultural Marxism is all, yeah. What 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 went wrong in the 60s and 70s, which causes the the, the problems we have today. So that would be a line to the future that I saw in in in, in these uh, uh, chapters. The second line is to say, well, how how particularly uh, music of ethnic minorities is very often uh, criminalized that's also really yeah a, a line that it, that is that is worthwhile mentioning that that certain music is creating nationalist uh, identities and group identities that have their own culture and their own musical culture uh, are being repressed that was one also very good uh, 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 line that I took from the book. Uh, Dina's own chapter on the castrati uh, as a symbolic preservation of the angelic uh, nature of young boys also made me think of how this angelic uh, nature of young boys has been pro very problematic uh, in another domain, namely the sexual abuse in the Roman Catholic uh, Church, which which really tackle uh, yeah, is, is a drawing on the same innocence uh, of, 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 of young kids. So again, a line from the past to the present that, that I saw and maybe I saw it completely wrong, but that is that was my that was my hinge of, of trying to translate what I read uh, to topical to topical problems. The fourth element is is the relation between fact and fiction, between storytelling and glorification. And Frank already mentioned the narco corridos, and uh, that was also uh, my main uh, my main uh, example uh, from from the book. And um, 
Yeah, and also the 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 lethal the in this sense uh, in this uh, this respect literally lethal dangers of using wrong words in your uh, in your songs in these narco corridos. The importance of the actual lyric is 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 stressed in quite a number of chapters, particularly in these narco corridos, but also, for example, in the chapter on 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 rap, to to mention a contemporary uh, example, where where the lyrics also mark the, the deviant nature of it and the glorification of violence, of 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 wealth, of of making money, etc., etc., and of drugs, uh, in, in not in the last place. Yeah, yet the narco corridos are also amongst the few present day music examples that is that are actually banned. This was also an interesting element that I saw. And then fifthly, of course, the protective role of mafia groups in, in Frank's own chapter uh, with respect to black uh, musicians in a yeah, racist time of, of US style apartheid in a way, which is also very interesting. Uh, the link with political and police corruption. Analytically, I thought this was one of the strongest uh, uh, chapter, uh, Frank. Um, what surprised me a bit is that mocking the authorities or let's say criticizing the authorities seem not to be such a big theme in most of them, most of the music style. It sounded through uh, in various chapters, most notably on the, the, the Greek uh, ribetico music and the rap again, but not as much as I, who grew up, as I said, in the punk era, anarchy for the UK, uh, had expected probably. I thought that, that criticizing the state, making a mockery of social control, uh, would have played a much uh, larger role. Music as a cover-up for atrocities was probably one of the saddest examples on how music and crime were related. Also because it deals so well with the cultural complexities of playing uh, certain music in certain settings, like tangos in concentration camps, uh, for example. Um, and because yeah, the, the, the personal memories are blurred and complex, also, this one on 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 uh, this Todas Tango was analytically a very strong uh, chapter and a lot of food. It gave a lot of food for thought about paradoxes. Uh, the use of ISIS dash using pop style songs uh, to lure fighters into the Islamic State into the, the so called Caliphate whilst banning the music from this so-called caliphate is also, is a gr is also a great example. Uh, the food for thought uh, it offers is also very rich, but I would, let, let's say, a very, oh no, let, let's continue first. A, a very different paradox is set out in the chapters on uh, uh, Rebetico and rap, uh, critical and dominant society and yet at the same time heavily commercialized in the case of rap and celebrating consumer culture and commodification of crime as such. So at the same time being critical and being completely, let's say, representatives of all the cultural values uh, of, 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 of a society. So in that sense, the food for thought is in the book. What I would have liked, of course, is that this food for thought was made explicit a little bit more. So that was, um, as we say in Dutch, you keep sitting on your hunger. I don't know how that translates in English anyway, but it, it means that it, it, it leaves you a little bit, a little bit unsatisfactory, uh, unsatisfying um, feeling to have such a rich uh, plethora of, of chapters of which you have all kind of connections in your head and you would want to have a good epilogue, uh, a good intro or a good outro uh, on, on that. Uh, so the book as such is very rich. I learned a lot from it, but I would have liked a connecting line a little bit more. Cheers. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Rene. I would like now to, um, to ask Jeff to share his comments with us. Thank you. I, um, sorry, it's a little dark here. It's just now approaching dawn over here in the, the west coast of California. So uh, you'll have to forgive things as things in my household are beginning to uh, move forward. And 
hopefully we won't have too much <laughs> disturbance as my children get ready for school in the background. But uh, thank you for um, for having me. Uh, Renee, thank you so much for your um, your structure of the comments and, and mirrored um, in many ways some of the things that I was going to say in terms of um, what I just mentioned briefly before we, we opened up to the attendees, um, whereas really where to start as a critic with the edited volume, because you have, you know, you have so many different works and, and, uh, and, and how do you carve out in a sense of a centralized criticism when even in the introduction, the authors are trying to establish, you know, what is this field and, and what is this, what should this inquiry look like? And, and have we even really developed ideas to, to, to dive into this? Um, and I, I think what I found very interesting to myself is once again, something Renee mentioned, which is that music is such a personal thing for all of us. And it's, um, I work, one, one of the things I run at San Diego State is on, um, I help run a, a data visualization lab and big data analytics. And one of my colleagues, Andre Scooping, is very, very prominent in that field. One of the projects he did is he worked on visualizing non-obvious relationships in musical taste. And what, you know, basically using data that you would compile. So for example, from like, if you're buying something from iTunes or if you're on YouTube and you skip the algorithms that go on in that big data analytics. And what was really interesting was how, when he visualized it, it was visualized like a bunch, like you're looking at the topography of a bunch of mountain ranges with certain mountains being higher than others, but mountains being adjacent to each other or connected to each other. And what you ended up finding is that as people would click you know, in, in purchasing their different music, they would go from mountaintop to mountaintop and in, in the areas and the places that really didn't seem to have discernible interest you know, with each other so that you, you know, you wouldn't pick up, you know, this ska music and then go over here to, you know, to Wagner and in, in, in opera or something else. And so the issue from the data standpoint becomes what are kind of the binding issues that can bring these things together. And of course, there's musical aspects, um, you know, in terms of instrumentation or anything else along those lines. But there's also the issue of substance of lyrics, or in the sense, the 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 feelings which are evoked by that by that particular meeting. And what you find is that people can have very very personal um, ways that they're going to inter interact psychologically, spiritually, emotionally, intellectually with that type of material taking this particular theme in its broadness and being able to, to develop, you know, what is that connectivity? It's going to be extremely difficult to do in one volume. And it's going to be very difficult to do in a way that's, like you said, it's going to leave you sitting on your hunger because it, when reading one goes, well, what about this issue? What about that issue? One of the interesting like things, for example, as I read it, I was asking myself, um, you know, we talk about crime, law, and justice, and restorative justice. We talk about social control and things like that. And I was thinking, well, gosh, I hope you do another volume. I'd like to write on this, which is the issue of what about things like hymns and how hymns would set up issues of social control of right and wrong and expected behaviors. But also, what are the aspects of restorative justice, amazing grace, right, and other concepts like that? And how those things can bleed in and how for centuries these, these things, in a sense, were our guideposts for both the control, but also the restorative aspects and how, how, how big those things are. And, of course, how they bleed in, as they were talking about in the article dealing with the murder ballads. And, that's, and, and once again, this is personal stuff. I mean, I, I'm reading this and, I, and I'm, I'm laughing because as, as, as an American, I have my descent comes from different cultures and different backgrounds. And. McElwain is a Scott name, and, and I, part of that is from the Scott, Scott immigrations going into um, uh, the Carolinas and then into Tennessee, and basically, you know, coming from the 1720s. A lot of that's the songs, like, for example, Johnny Cash is a patron saint. You know, <laughs> Hank Williams is a patron saint. These are folks that when they talk, they talk about brokenness and addiction and alcohol and, you know, all these different things. But then they all have this restorative coming to the cross, you know, redemptive sort of idea, the great the speckled bird, uh, these wonderful lyrics that they talk about as they're dealing with this catharsis that's going on in this formation, the spiritual formation in the life between youth and looking back like Johnny Cash, you know, in his, in his, in his song Hurt, 
where he goes back and talk picks the Nine Inch Nails lyrics and turns it into this spiritual lament about this empire of dirt and everything that I built and how I look at this. So this, these are, it's a very powerful thing. But then I flip the script and then I go, okay, I'm Mexican on my mom's side, right? <laughs> so, so I'm, we're Norteños. We're from Sonora for 400 years. Sonora and Arizona and New Mexico and, and the California. And I spent 15 years working in Mexico on dealing with drug violence issues and, and the forensics issues. And I was at case scene after scene where these murders and violence were occurring with singers that were there. And, you know, you don't request this song when you're in Manzanillo and you don't request this song if you're in Zacatecas or Michoacan or in, or in Chihuahua. There, you just, there are certain things, certain artists you just would not do because it would be viewed as insulting because literally the lyrics are insulting one cartel against another or one one person against another but there were bigger things than that too similar things that you know you can look at the extortion that goes on in those industries but also in many of the places where these songs are played they're happening in small little plazas in little, in little towns and county seats you know and when people show up on the weekend you know people like to promenade they like to show off it used to be that drive horses they provide their horses as a way of showing off and showing masculinity um, to possible suitors, you know, as possible suitors. Now it might be driving a car, driving a lowrider, driving other things like that to bring that attention. The music, of course, is the theme and the background, but within this comes the competition and the and the grief, the grievances and everything else. So a lot of times when my colleagues who were in the forensic side, who as we were attempting to um reform a lot of the forensic aspects to go into the criminal justice system in Mexico as it converted its legal approaches to dealing with crime from Napoleonic to more common law-based approaches. We had to deal with things like evidence custody and, and how you deal with the autopsies and all these other things like that. And so when when we were doing this, one of the things we found is a lot of times it was, oh, they killed them because they sang all song lyrics. But then once we started implementing a lot of these other things, we we're finding out, no, actually, there was a grievance that went out in this plaza. They, everybody was going to be there. These are public spectacles. Concerts are public spectacles. It's where the community comes together. So if you're doing messaging rhetorically, you have your violent act and you, you take advantage of that concert to, to do that. In some cases, the musicians might be killed. In other cases, it's other people in the crowd. But in other cases, and I have a wonderful picture queued up, and I don't know if I show it, but one of the sites we had, what you do is you take the decapitated heads of the people you killed and the rivals that would have been part of that music that you heard, and you take those heads and you roll them into the middle of a crowded dance floor and leave five heads in the middle of it, along with a sign and a placa, a, a message, telling you why you dropped these heads off here and why that sort of stuff was going on. So you know, all theater, all art has context, right? And so, so as I'm looking at this personally, and I'm reading this article personally, I'm, I'm, it's just like with music, right? When you sit with your friends, it's like, you know, you're listening to, you know, to, to Jimmy Page and you're like, you know, well, what about that? And what about the influence here on, on Randy Rhodes? And how did this thing happen here? And what about Clapton and what he did on this thing? You know, you have your individual favorites, but then you have your prejudices and you have these things. And when we read these things, what we take to these articles this is what I felt myself doing. I wanted, I wanted to have that same sort of discussion with the authors and say, oh, that's great, but what about this? Oh, that's wonderful. What about this thing right here, right? And, 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 and it, because we, we have knowledge of our music that we're passionate about, our artists that we're passionate about. Um, and when we look at the entirety of the whole here, we get these great passionate articles about, about certain things. And there's, it just shows you the richness of this field because now it's like, what can we add to those things that were talked about? Not just in terms of the articles themselves, but also other traditions. I mean, I'm sitting here going, okay, what about um, you know, Chinese revolutionary songs that dealt with concepts of, of justice and, and social control and things along those lines? And you know, how do totalitarian regimes as a whole? Is there, is there a context? I was teaching my course on totalitarianism yesterday, and we were talking part of, about this was the ideological symmetry rhetorically, and also if you're using Hoffer, like the true believer and the followers, what are those characteristics that play themselves out in that art? And we were using film, and we we're using Triumph of the Will, and we we're using you know some of the classics that come out in that regard. But 
what what can we do by looking and broadening it out, looking at these different traditions? And of course, we need scholars who are familiar with it intimately, because as an outsider, one can sit and approach a music, you know, and say, I mean, um, one of the other things, like I said, music's personal. Um, for the last 18 years, I've besides working at state, I've also been working for the United States Defense College for Special Operations, and I work in what's called a regular warfare. And I've worked heavily dealing with issues related to <coughs> ISIS and you know the different groups that are there. Started working on Al Qaeda back in 1995, actually with Alan on an investigation we were working on on something when I was in grad school with Alan Block. And and in doing this, I became very familiar with these songs that were referred to, right? The things that are there. And 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 when I look at this and go, okay, structurally, rhetorically, how are those similar to other things that were sung other places? I was engaged in this huge analysis of taking that rhetorical, that speech of, of different leaders and showing overlap with regard to other on um, on. Um, um, what they call occidentalists you know, or other other forms of, of 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 speech because the structure was so similar and but this leaves me going now what is the music how does the music have maybe similar structure in terms of the laments in terms of the critiques in terms of the complaints of the protest but also in terms of the social control yeah and it's propaganda and psyops right and i'm looking at the comment here and 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 it's a very big big area it's it's a very big um of area that they do use deal what's called miso psyops was how how do you understand local music traditions in indonesia for example they would be coming out of um out of puppet shows you know puppet shows are the way people communicate and there's the music that's attached to those puppet shows in afghanistan you're going to have your poetry and his poetry is lyricized sometimes in recitation you know there's structural elements here that this is so rich to be able to build upon because we I don't know how well we can get to a general theory until we have more of these case studies to draw from, until we can start doing meta analysis. Uh, I mean, when when I'm reading you know Frank's work on jazz clubs, I'm thinking, okay, does that work with um oh Eric? I can't remember his his last name, but he's a professor out of uh, UC Irvine who writes on heavy metal Islam, where he talks about in Egypt and other places where teen rebellion, they don't want to go with ISIS, but they also know that there's corruption in their system and, they're, and they understand these things. So what happens is they've latched on to heavy metal artists as a way of protest and, and, and doing so in a way that entails risk, just like it did if you were German and you were in the, um, and you liked jazz music during the 1930s, you know, there was going to be some attendant risk to that. And, and you see that same sort of formation. And it's a, it's a, um, you know, how, how can those things, um, how can we, in a sense, generalize those experiences? How can, can we sit and say, are those clubs going through the same thing? Are people shaking down those clubs? Are those artists and performers engaged in that organization of crime? Is the extortion happening like it talks about in Frank's thing? Is this happening in Albania? Is this happening in, in uh, other clubs, perhaps in Sweden or somewhere else along those lines? How much of this is universal? And then how much of it is unique to these individual case studies? And, and that to me is what I, I think is something that really draws me uh, to, this, to this subject that really, really gets my interest on um, looking now when you deal with um, whole geographic areas, uh, whole cultural areas that are missing, that are not part of this conversation. Um, that, as I should mention, punk rock, I mean, I grew up in the same era with punk, Renee and I, you know, getting ourselves, I always, I always yell at my students nowadays, it's like, there's no punk in you guys anymore, why do you guys just show up with your papers and turn them in, you know, it's like, you know, and I, I, you know, because it's, it's really frustrating, and, and, but that's, once again, it's, it's a personal experience, but it's not there, and it's a big one, you know, when you see on um, pictures of uh, in, uh, in, in Russia when, as a teenage punk, you know, back in the day in the 80s, and you realize the power of that as it related to some of the later events that happened in Eastern and Central Europe. It was, it was a, a huge deal. Um, and so I, I would like to see more of this. And I would, I, it would be wonderful. And I'd want to encourage you guys to consider a second volume, because I think that there's, once again, there's so much material to add before we can break out to the general before we can start taking these other cultural, you know, criminological theories or sociological theories and I mean, uh, musical theories and to play it in. I mean, I, I was laughing at this because I went, uh, I, 
the church that which I'm a member uh, here in, in San Diego, I, the minister of music, I was talking to him about this uh, after, on Sunday, and I said to him, I said, uh, it would, I said it'd be really, I said it'd be really interesting if you and I can maybe collaborate on writing an article <laughs> based on the hymnal, you know. And, and this guy is about as vanilla pudding as you're going to get, right? I'm like the rebel in the in the, in the room, and and he's like, and, he, and I said it'd be really cool if we can sit and do this because I have a structure in my head, but you have the knowledge of the material and how much great stuff and and contextualizing these stories. I mean, when you talk about like a song, for example, like Amazing Grace. Think about this from a restorative justice standpoint. The person who was a slave trader, somebody who was, in, who was in the deepest, darkest depths of darkness in their life, in the cruelty and the savagery that went along with that trade, who turns his life around, you know, has his road to Damascus moment, and tells the story to somebody who hears this and is ministering to this person to help them to make these changes in their lives, to, to, to find this resolution, who pens this classic opus about amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. We work with Restorative Justice Project. We have a project at our, pro at our university called Project Rebound, where we're taking um, felons who distinguish themselves under incarceration um, and have really shown that, hey, listen, they're really, they want to break the cycles here. So we set up a program here, Alan Mobley, one of my good colleagues, uh, uh, Stuart Henry, who is my department chair, who some of you will obviously know, set up with this program that we can bring people in to this, um, into the university to begin to help them to deal with the recidivism issues, but also to reintegrate. And what's so beautiful about this is that when everybody's in my office, you go to my office, I actually have a, an LP player and I have a bunch of vinyl in my office. And on any given day, I'm playing mariachi music. I'm playing, you know, <laughs> I'm playing, you know, some form of classical or jazz, or I'm playing punk rock and, or country music or something else. So the music tends to walk in the halls. And, 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 and it's a sweet aroma that on a given day will bring a different student with a different background. But what it does is it engenders these personal discussions, which I love. This is the best part about being a professor, those relationships we have with those that are entrusted to us. And you get to learn about people. And they'll say, hey, Mac, you know, my Mac point. So how do you know how do you know about this person over here? How, how do you get into Sturgill Simpson? You know, Sturgill Simpson is a very well-known country artist that's not very popular, but he writes these great songs. And it's like, well, yeah, it's like here. It's like, well, yeah, he's pretty much into this. You know, we start talking, and this leads to their discussion of drugs. This leads to the discussion of narcotics. This leads to this other exploration as to why they're attracted to that music. And I'll share why I'm attracted to it. And it allows for these discussions. So in ending, I thought it was kind of interesting to think about how does this and how does music even help us, not just as scholars, but many of us are educators. Many of us are policymakers that come to these conferences, right? But how does music engage with conversations? Because we can talk about music and have our opinions and argue about it or do this, or we, and, or we can also sit and listen, right? Why is that your favorite song? Why do you like that music? And people are passionate about that. And they'll, they'll rip their hearts out and their mind out and tell you the story of, of why that lyric, why that song matters so much. I love my 16-year-old son. It's, he's, he's exploring music. He's like, Dad, I hate all the music nowadays. I'm like, you know, he likes The Clash. He loves all this thing. I'm getting them all schooled up just right, you know. But he loves all these wonderful music. But I ask him, why, why do you like that song? And he goes, Dad, because right now, you know, when you see people gossiping on social media and all they're doing is they're looking at this consumerism and they're doing these sort of things. And it's like, how cool he's thinking about that. But that's a conversation I'm not having without music. And so as we deal with this academically, I also want us to think of this practically. How do we apply this in our, as professors, as teachers, but also as policymakers? Talk to the people that are out there and say, why do you like this music? Why is this such a big deal? And I think we have great places to be able to sit, to build up on collaboration, to think about conflict resolution, to think about other things that it really offers us. You know, I didn't realize that was an issue of justice we had to be concerned about. I didn't realize that those people I'm blaming for out there marching right now that are these middle-class people, these populists, but why are they really doing this? Listen to the music, right? You know, all the music that you hear that, I, I don't hear white supremacy in it. And for example, in some of the country music, I hear it coming from economic dislocation. I'm talking about disempowerment and corruption. I'm hearing other things that are coming out of that. 
And what it does is it forces us to encounter our own prejudice as we look at social movements, as we look at concepts of justice, as we look at politics, as we look at the ideology, the way we construct it. And I think that's a good day when we're able to do that. And music gives us that safe place. And I'll end on that. Thank you. Thank you very uh, much. <laughs> Frank, can, can I just... Uh, you have the floor. If, if, you, you. Allow, if you allow me. <laughs> um, First of all, thank, thank you very much, uh, both uh, Rene and Jeff. Um, absolutely um, right critique, and I think we are very happy to hear your, your views on this. Uh, and what I learned from this is, um, first of all, that there are much more things which are missing than what <laughs> we, we introduced in our book. And that I, I'd like to defend a little bit just to make sure that um, this book is not just a... You know, uh, don't take that as a criticism. That's that's realistic. You can't. It is realistic. Have, yeah. Yeah. It's completely realistic, and this is the this is a step, and this is a valuable first step. So please don't don't take it more than what it, I think we can overuse that. No, no, no. Of, but that's exactly also the um, what I would say. Uh, that was our purpose, just to to start this discussion and to start the to open this topic to criminologists. Because, uh, for example, what Rene mentioned that in 70s, 80s, uh, he was uh, grown up on uh, punk, on uh, rap, on hip hop music. This you, you will find some of, um, of these topics coming back in criminological research, especially young criminologists today, they do refer to, to these topics. But to embrace all the scope of possibilities uh, from um, castrati to opera to, um, I don't know, uh, we missed, of course, music as torture or what, what, uh, um, what Jeff mentioned, Amazing Grace. I immediately think about Andrea Bocelli, who was singing Amazing Grace in times of uh, COVID-19 in Milan, which is another context of um, solidarity, of unification. It's not only um, on not only the, the justice or restorative justice, but I think that there are so, so many topics and there is a mosaic of topics and we can, of course, write an encyclopedia of music and crime. But our purpose was to bring together criminologists and non-criminologists. So what you will find in our, uh, in our book is uh, there are authors from different disciplines, from musicology, from history, from uh, law, so they, they, we wanted to hear the perspectives, not only from critical criminology, which I totally agree with, uh, with Rene, that from critical or cultural criminological perspective, this will be, of course, very important to go in depth in, in these specific topics, but to bring their own vision, because um, nobody can monopolize this topic of music. It's not only for musicologists and it's not only for sociologists, Music, as Jeff says, uh, it's very individual, but it's also individual in terms of a discipline. How do we approach it? So each part of our book can be a book in itself. <laughs> it's only uh, just a very, very um, tiny touch on what can be done and what can be said. So it, you can see it as an example of possibility to connect different uh, disciplines and different topics and try to understand them uh, from different perspectives. And of course, we miss music industry and the music uh, censorship, uh, spiritual music, especially now in COVID times, uh, which is growing a lot. There are so, uh, so, so many things to say. And uh, of course, sorry that we could not cover it, but I think it's, uh, it's, uh, it's just the beginning of the discussion. Thank you very much. Answered some of the questions that were raised by uh... Jack and uh, NA. I must also say we knew, of course, from the beginning that it would be impossible to encompass the whole world and the whole history in all, in all its variety on music and crime. But what I thought, what I found in their comments was the same kind of enthusiasm for the subject that we encountered when we tried to recruit people. To, uh, to write chapters for our, for our book, isn't it? Everybody's coming with his own subject. I think that the two gentlemen have uh, brought forward 
together more than several times of all the topics that we have been dealing with in the uh, in the book. And of course, it's an impossible task to think of one unified theory, but well, at least that's what we accomplished, didn't we? To make people enthusiastic for this for the subject. Exactly how do we go on? Are we now uh, in a position to give the floor to other people who are w watching this? Can I briefly say something, Frank? Because, of course, that is that is what I understood. It was my comments were out of enthusiasm. You're absolutely <coughs> right about that. I was I was intrigued by 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 the chapters and being a theor uh, theoretician myself, I always think theory, right? <laughs> I always think what would be the wider theory uh, uh, behind it, uh, particularly because music is about emotions and about stirring up emotions and. Uh, uh, repressing emotions at the same time so I would I would say if I were let's say thinking forwards of a unifying theory of music that's probably impossible but the role of music in 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 uh, identity formation that would definitely be a direction where I where I would look and of course you cannot cover anything everything you did you did your best though by identifying at least five themes and um, yeah, maybe also um, we could uh, have a kind of sequel and let's say something on uh, on resistance in music, a whole book on resistance, a whole book on, on, on well, uh, the criminalization of music. So there is a, a future ahead of us, but it, it definitely touches a chord. And this was also what I, I listened uh, when I listened to Jeffrey. I mean, music, music moves you, literally. Everybody probably in a different way, but it does touch you in a different way than words can touch you. Well, maybe also novels, but let's say from acad sheer academic journals, if I read criminology with all these uh, Greek, Greek symbols and a lot of figures, it doesn't give me the same emotions than uh, listening to music. Let's put it that way. <laughs> that's, that's, that would be my, um, my brief answer. Okay. And, and, I like, I, and I, I'm going to add to that too. When we start, I really appreciate the interdisciplinary aspect. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I, I, I bathe in interdisciplinary <laughs> approaches. I love it. And, you know, when we think about this moving forward to another thing I, I want to just put in your heads, if you do another volume, is to think about the issues of things like how music therapy is used for different people who've gone through trauma and victims and also for people, you know, to, to work out various things. One of my students is now in Europe studying um, as a music and criminal justice major who's now pursuing that in graduate work. And, and so there's, there's some great things there, but that, that power... It reminded me, as you were just speaking, Renee, but there's a wonderful clip on YouTube and it's it's about, there's a film but with Robin Williams called Awakenings that came out quite a few years ago, about 20 years ago, about how people that come out of these deep vegetative states that their brains are not working, but they came out and all of a sudden they were able to be fully cognizant. Many of them end up going back to that spot. But this video, what's wonderful about it is it's taking people in, in geriatrics and it's playing for them music and people that can't talk that are shells and old folks home in homes for the elderly and they're, they're they're really just seem to be just okay there's somebody who's alive there but there's nobody home and then what they do is they put earphones in and they play music and you see them do this oh i love that song and all of a sudden their voice comes back their memories they start sharing everything right these, I, the reason I mentioned this is we're talking about therapy in this regard. Many people in their in the 80s, 90s have went through very traumatic things during the Holocaust or during other periods of time after during the Cold War and the, the, the wars and the insurgencies and things, ethnic cleansings that happen in different parts of the world. This being a tool for people in terms of memory. So as we, even as we're talking about the, the things we talked about later in the book, you know, how, how does an interdisciplinary approach like that impact this stuff too? How do these things, you know, when you hear things, because right now um, a friend of mine own, owns some homes for the, the elderly, rehabilitative homes, and they have people that live through the Holocaust. And when they're put in an institutionalized setting, all of a sudden these things have been pushed back have now come back. 
And they're trying to find ways to have people who may have dementia or may have Alzheimer's or other ways of doing it. And with the, one of the things that when we're talking about, I mentioned them, think about music, think about positive things that can be played that replaces a positive memory to counteract that institutional memory that they have of the person in the coat, the person of telling them what to do, the sterile confines. How do you, how do you use music as a way of doing it? So, I mean, the possibilities are endless and, and I think it's really interesting. And as he says, like a volume on this, a volume on that, perhaps, I mean, this could be a, this could be a treasure trove to, to, to dive into over, over the years to come. And I congratulate you guys. I, I'm really, I'm really thankful that you guys took the time and effort to put this together. Well, if we would be instrumental in just promoting that idea, I would be very, very happy with it. Tina? Yeah, maybe we can look if there are any comments or questions in, in the chat. I have seen one Two. which was from uh, Andre Anisimov, who said, it's very interesting how music changes mass culture and deconstructs some social norms about tattoos, sex, drugs, and, and so forth. Um, and maybe, I don't know if he's still there or, but just to, that reminds me, um, the short research I did on uh, Russian bard music and the influences of the prison music and Russian prison music uh, on young people uh, and how the um, lyrics of this prison ergot um, used in, in these uh, songs, uh, including songs of uh, Vysotsky and Akujava, how it entered the lexicon of, uh, of young people and still continues, and not only young people, but also politicians today are using this criminal uh, prison jargon or ergot, uh, which was used in, in these uh, songs of bards. So that's um, just to, to relate to, to his comment. Um, and then there and is a conversation. I have to add on to that too. When yeah. you mentioned without drugs, it's funny, in my, my graduate seminar that I have for um, narcotics and narcotics control and trafficking, literally the, the quarter of the class, the whole first quarter, in order to go over the history of drugs and its interactions with culture, I literally for five weeks, three hour seminar, it's all based on music. Yeah. And all we do is we use music as each step of the way. And I starting out, I start with Joplin and, and ragtime jazz. Take you into the speak the, the bordellos of New Orleans and Storyville. And from there, craft the story of how art, you know, creates, you know, creates this reality, but how the reality creates the art. And we go all the way through that to bebop jazz and Charlie Parker and to, you know, all the things that Frank was talking about in the jazz clubs, right? But then we are also talking about Hank Williams and we're talking about these other art forms. And then we get into, we get into the different ballads of the, the different beer drinking songs and alcohol with, from coming out of Ireland and coming from Germany and the immigrant waves in the United States and how these things play out and what they deal with. And then we move into the rock era, right? And then we get into the you know psychedelic era, the rap music, the you know Eric Clapton singing about cocaine, and we see the norming of things, right? You know, criminologically, how we norm behaviors, and it's such a rich thing. And it, it was it's, it's interesting to be able to take that and adapt that. Um, it would be it'd be it's just pretty cool. It's pretty cool. So thanks for bringing that comment up because it's. Right on point. Okay. Dina, you were mentioning about uh, music as torture. And then, of course, I was always, I'm always thinking of A Clockwork Orange, where Beethoven is used as, as a mechanism of torture. Just, just to remind you that I don't know whether that's the case in the US as well, but in, in Europe, uh, classical music is very often played in subway stations because the youth hanging around there don't like it. Is that torture or isn't it? You know, that because it has so much, so many layers. <laughs> that is really worthwhile to 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 uh, to analyze. They do that. The one community they here in the states they were playing Barry Manilow, so <laughs> to do the same thing. <laughs> yeah, but then you chase away the elderly, probably. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And the Central Park in in New York. Uh, just maybe to give an example from from the Netherlands um, today, if you say um, criminology of music or something like this, uh, the immediate association will be with the drill rap. And this, this is uh, connected to the killings uh, among the, the gangs, uh, we call them drill, drill rap gangs today, uh, which even uh, constructed this 
image of uh, the Netherlands who becoming not only narco state <laughs> as, as it is uh, promoted today in the in the media but also the you know these gangsters who are killing each other because of music because of the possession and this brings me Jeff to your narco corridas of course yes. of which uh, which is a culture in itself and the narco corrida singers and producers of this music this this is a rivalry and you know it's actually a war of narco corridos huh? right and it yeah. and but that culture goes back even before the narco aspect sure. you know mexican history uh pedro infante is like the frank sinatra of mexico a very famous singer a very famous actor and also believe he's having an affair with the first lady of mexico so his plane drops out of the air. Uh, dropping planes out of the air is a, is a very favored way of assassination historically in Mexico for popular figures. Or the mm -hmm. interior president of Mexico a few years ago was killed um, in the same way. I've actually met with him and I met with the head of Seattle, which is the organized crime unit, two days before that. And they were both killed. And the message that was sent is if we can reach them, we can reach you. In that same so when you when you see like once again these are rhetorical acts and these are rhetorical things in, in the music so the music itself touches back to a bigger culture of violence and power and 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 illegitimate networks you know reaching up to the legitimate when those agreements that they have and the and the the, the, the taboos are are crossed you just don't mess with my wife right <laughs> you know that sort of idea and it's, it's, it's a very fascinating thing. And I'm sure if we deconstruct all these traditions, we're going to see similar things going back for decades. And, you know, when people okay. are just playing. I am warned room. by the manager that we have only 15 or even less minutes left. Isn't it, uh, can't we ask people from the public also to respond? Well, what is, may I invite any one of you who, uh, well, I've seen chats coming by now and then. Who is willing to take the floor? Nobody. If nobody, then I will take the floor again. Sorry. Uh, and this is about the function of music. Of course, we, we talked about, first of all, why are we so fascinated with music and why we are so fascinated with crime in music? One of our uh, authors, um, um, Lodebeck Brunt, was, uh, he wrote about the violence in opera. Uh, why is it so uh, long ago already was so important? And there is no opera actually without violence or murder or rape or whatever, or organized crime, whatever you like to, to see that. But why? Why are we so fascinated with this? This is one of the theoretical maybe aspects of, uh, to, to think about. Uh, and the second is a function of music. And I'm looking today on the function of music in, in the COVID time, when all these balcony concerts are taking place in Italy and uh, somewhere else, where people try to find their way to, to uh, communicate with each other in music. And you see these famous opera singers who are singing from their kitchens just to create a contact with the others to show their solidarity and to show that we are together in these difficult times. So the function of music, and if you go back to, to history, of course, you will see that this was the most important in all kinds of pandemics and epidemics, uh, where there was spiritual course to, to, to chase away the evil spirits from, uh, from the society. So music has always a function. I think this is Next book, huh, Frank? <laughs> yes, a good idea. Okay. Who oh, may I give the floor? Any? Otherwise, I would say uh, this is enough. We uh, enjoyed it tremendously to talk to you. We thank you for your comments as well as for the praise that you gave us. Thank you very much. And maybe we'll come with another book on the subject. There are suggestions enough, I understand. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the OC24 podcast. For more talks, have a look at the podcast feed on whichever platform you use. There are loads more to listen to. Video versions of these talks are also available on the Global Initiative Against Transnational Organized Crime YouTube channel. 
If you would like to share these talks around, we ask that you use the hashtag OC24 and let us know what you think. The 24-hour conference on global organised crime is brought to you by the European Consortium of Political Research Standing Group on Organised Crime, the Centre for Information and Research on Organised Crime, the International Association for the Study of Organised Crime, and the Global Initiative Against Transnational Organised Crime. For more information, head over to oc24.globalinitiative.net. This has been the OC24 podcast from the Global Initiative Against Transnational Organised Crime. Thanks for listening.